warm welcome to St George's Tron to our Easter Sunday service. Let me begin before I say anything else by saying, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. <laughs> Um, very warm welcome to our service. My name is Fiona. I'm one of the elders uh, here at St. George's Tron. Uh, warm welcome to anyone who's visiting with us today. I think I do see one or two new faces. You're very welcome. I hope someone's spoken to you and made you welcome. And a warm welcome to everybody watching on the live stream as well. Uh, just checking, we definitely have the live stream on. Yes, we do. Good. A warm welcome if you're watching at home then. We have one or two notices um, for Easter Sunday, so I'll go through these and... If towards the end you think I've forgotten a notice, please do in time-honoured St. George's Tron fashion, wave at me frantically and I will like, uh, give you the floor and you can say what you have to share. First thing I want to remind us all is Alistair is still off. He is here in the room and we are delighted he's here in the room and sharing with us in worship, but Alistair's off for the next few weeks. So this is just a gentle reminder that if you're speaking to Alistair, it should be about lovely Easter things and general chit chat and asking after his health if you have anything to say about church related matters please stay away from him and come and see either Pete over there or myself or me or Sandra or anybody else who's part or Helen anyone who's part of the leadership team please that would be great uh, things on this week in the church were fairly quiet at the moment we've got the prayer meeting happening Wednesday evening now our prayer meeting meets in person in the west end if you'd like to come along you can ask one of us in the leadership team for more details of that it's also available via zoom if you live slightly further away and you would like to join in via zoom so come and speak to again either Pete or myself or um, some may in the leadership team and we can tell you more about the prayer meeting Wednesday evening at seven o'clock for that the men, next men's breakfast is on next Saturday at Glasgow City Mission at nine o'clock in the morning. And I, obviously, being a breakfast, unless you eat breakfast at nine o'clock at night. Um, I understand Brandon is the person to see for that. Is that right? Yes. Yes, Brandon. You're not going to miss Brandon today. Brandon, can I get you to stand up? I'm sorry. It's just, it's just stunning. Brandon is truly celebrating the, the season of spring and all the bright colours. So, yes, yeah, see Brandon if you wish to come along to the men's breakfast. The Wild Olive Tree Cafe will reopen tomorrow, Easter, Easter Monday. So if you are off tomorrow, if it's a public holiday for you and you're coming into town, then, you know, step out of the madness in Buchanan Street to come into this probably slight madness in here for soup and a scone. Um, so you're very welcome for that. Uh, just a reminder, we don't uplift an offering during our service, but we do encourage giving. In fact, uh, those of you that were here last week would remember we were looking in the sermon about how there's no ordinary small acts for God. Everything that God asks us to do, no matter how strange or mundane or, or routine, is all part of preparing the way for a ministry for him. And someone came up and said, that was great, but you didn't mention money. And I was like, oh, right enough, I didn't. But it's a reminder that our giving is part of preparing for the Lord's ministry. So this isn't for visitors, but this is for those of us that are regular here at St. George's Tron and call this our church family. Um, please do use the giving box that we've got at the back, just behind Helen there. Or if you'd like to give regularly. Um, we had our AGM last week, obviously. We're looking at finances. It is a concern for us as a church. These things don't happen just by magic. But if God is calling you to think about what giving uh, to his ministry looks like, then come and speak to one of us and we can help you with that. We have prayer ministry after the service today. Uh, I don't actually know who is on the road, but that corner over there where the bamboo screens are, if you would like prayed for at the end of the service, if something has really touched your heart and you'd like to explore it more, if you've got something coming up this week, you would like someone to pray with you. If you hover about that corner, uh, I think there are one or two folks around who are trained in, oh, Anna's on it. Anna's on prayer ministry today. Great. So Anna will be leading the prayer ministry. Probably someone else will be involved too. But go uh, and hang around that corner and we will pray with you at that point. Uh, Helen has asked me to say a huge thank you for the Easter eggs. How many did you get in the end, Helen? 55 Easter eggs were donated. These were small Easter eggs um, that were being given away. If you remember at Christmas time, we were giving away little gift packs to some of the redeemed customers in the Wild Olive Tree. So the plan was to bless them with a gift of an Easter egg. So 55, and did they all go? All went, all went. Excellent, all went by Thursday coffee time. So that's great news. So thank you so much for everybody that supported that. That's a really lovely thing to do for some of the redeemed customers that use the Wild Olive Tree. 
Also, a big thank you for those who came along to the Seder meal here in the church on Thursday night, but also a massive thank you to those who prepared uh, the Seder meal and did a lot of the, the work behind the scenes for that. I'm not going to name names in case I end up missing somebody out, but you know who you are and you did an incredible job. Uh, those of us that were at the Seder meal would say it was, a, it was a wonderful evening. The food was excellent. The company was great. And it was just a lovely, lovely experience. If this, I'm not, I don't want to speak too soon and say this is something we're going to repeat every year, but if we are repeating it next year and you didn't get a chance to go uh, this year, then I would highly recommend it. But a huge thank you to everybody who contributed to that. Now, as we're speaking about acts of service and no routine and small things we can do for the Lord, we need volunteers to help today with washing the dishes. Uh, no soup plates to clear today. Obviously, we've done a much more picnic lunch, but the plates will still need washed and put away, etc. Um, if you've, please volunteer, if you've never done it before, maybe today's the day God is calling you to volunteer. So can we get maybe three or four folk willing to put their hands up? We've got one, two, three, four. Oh, we've got, excellent, super. Four volunteers, but anyone else, please just pitch in as you are able. I think those are all the notices, unless someone's going to, no, Ruth. <laughs> Do you want to just come in? I'm going to have to refer to Alistair for this. Glasgow City Mission is having uh, two weeks today on Sunday evening a uh, Thanksgiving service. Is that right? And uh, they're inviting everybody who uh, supports them to come to that. It's at Adelaide Place Baptist Church up the road. Uh, we'll be more specific with details next Sunday, but it's a great opportunity. We, we partner with Glasgow City Mission. Um, and it's a great opportunity just to uh, come together, just to hear about some of the work that they do with uh, folk um, and just take that forward in prayer. Okay. Great. So that's two weeks' time, is it, Ruth? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that's Sunday the 14th of April. Sunday the 14th of April in the evening, that service will be on. So that sounds a good thing to be involved in. Uh, 6.30. 6.30. There we go. So precise with the details. Okay, I think that is all our notices today. We're going to begin our service of work. Oh, <laughs> okay. You see what I mean about in time on a fashion. This is, if you are new to St. George's Strong, this is how we do the intimations. <laughs> Okay, so that's just a reminder to look on the organisation, the Christian organisation CARE. If you have a look on their website, they are currently um, working around this new conversion therapy bill that's going um, through Parliament just now. And 2nd of April, which I think is Tuesday, is apparently the deadline for submission. So if you'd like to find out more about what that is, please check out uh, CARE's website for more details. We're now going to enter our worship time, uh, or rather our more formal worship. This is all, all worship. Our eating together in hospitality is all part of our worship today. Um, Callum is going to be leading us today in looking at scripture. Um, and the band are going to be coming up in a moment just to lead us in our sung worship. But I'm going to begin just with a few verses from Psalm 22, the Messianic Psalm. This is our call to worship today. You're the reason for my praise. It comes from you and goes to you. I will keep my promise to praise you before all who fear you, among the congregation of your people. Let all the poor and broken eat until satisfied. Bring Yahweh praise and you will find him. May your hearts overflow with life forever. Amen. Let's come before God in prayer. Lord God, we meet today and say, Alleluia. We say, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. We give you praise and thanks today, Lord, for our lives and for life eternal. Lord, today is the day we remember that Lord Jesus Christ is the conqueror of death and hell. He is the gateway to life everlasting. 
And Lord, we come here today to worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to praise you for your life-giving, life-renewing powers. We are rejoicing today, Lord. We are celebrating that he who was dead is alive. He who was buried is risen. Death is conquered and we are free. Christ has won the victory. Lord, as we worship today, would you make us aware of your presence? Make us aware of the presence of the risen Christ. Make us aware of the presence of your spirit amongst us today. As a church of your people, Lord, let us proclaim the good news. He is risen. Let us lead people. Let us lead one another out of darkness into light. Lord, as we meet here this morning, we'd ask that you would scatter the darkness from our hearts and from your world. And we ask you to bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to hand over to... Oh, sorry, to Sam. Yes, apologies. I'm getting the, <laughs> getting the order wrong. We are going to say the words of a Sam together. Um, Again, if this is your first time at St George's Strong, this was a habit we got into during lockdown times when we could not sing together, we could recite the psalms together. So the psalm today, the declaratory psalm, is Psalm 16, and the words are going to appear on the screen. I think we're going to be saying the whole psalm. Would you, if you're able, would you stand please, and we'll say together the words of Psalm 16. Keep me safe, my God. For in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom all, all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand.
Yeah. 
risen from the dead See Mary weeping Where is he laid? As in sorrow she turns we've had to think about and reflect on over the last three days that you were laid in the tomb the enormity of what happened that day what the enormity of what happened on Friday that it shook creation it shook the cosmos for though you appeared as a young man being punished to those who watched that day you are the ancient of days since the beginning of time, Lord Jesus. And this event, this seismic, cosmic event has been planned since then and the earth felt it. Father, it seems that our praise and our thanks this morning can sound so small compared to what was achieved that day, what has been done for us. But it is our prayer this morning, Lord, you would give us once again a sense of awe. Give us legs that tremble as we stand and praise you and think about what you have done for us. Father, we give you praise that the cross, an instrument used to shame people, an instrument used to torture people, to execute, this cross has become a symbol of redemption a symbol of hope and Father we talk about this being a cosmic event through all creation and yet it was also for each individual one of us here today whoever we are standing here today whatever our name is whatever our background is whatever families we have come from wherever we live in this country in this world every single one of us is known before you the hairs on our head counted you died for each one of us Lord and you rose for each one of us Father as we continue with our worship now we would ask that you would speak afresh into our hearts if there are things in our life sins that we still carry would you show them to us now Lord give us a place and space to confess before you let us take this opportunity of mercy of forgiveness 
redemption. Father, give us hearts that love. Because ultimately, Lord, we think about the fact that because, because of what happened on the Friday, because of what happened on the Sunday, death is dead and love has won. Lord Jesus, as we contemplate the depth of your love, Lord God, would you give us the ability to love you back, to love you with our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength and turn to love one another as you have loved us.
from the cross to the resurrection for those who followed you. Those moments of uncertainty, that time passing of the unknown, to have placed their faith, their hope in you, but to have no knowledge of what came next, of where to go, of what to do, that sense of despair, that sense of hopelessness. And then, for the rumor to spread, the whisper on the wind that he is risen, the encounters one by one as they met with you face by to face to realize that you are alive. Almighty God, we are so grateful that we stand here today in the glory of the resurrection to know and declare you are risen, you are alive. The God who would do everything for us out of love, to bring us back to you, to restore what was broken, to give us hope for the future. Almighty God, what else can we do but offer what we have, what we are, who we are into your hands, to let your spirit move us and shape us and lead us onwards into your purposes in this world. There are times in our lives of uncertainty where we do not know what comes next. But Father, we trust in you, the one who is at work, the one with plans and purposes and love and compassion for the whole world. Help us to trust and to follow you. And now we say together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much to Fiona and the band for leading us at that opening of our service. Um, If you're new here, another little thing that we like to do as part of our service is to just have a little chance to kind of talk around the tables. It's going to be a question which only relies on your own expertise, your own experience, and just have a little chat with the folks around the table that will kind of connect into where we're going in the sermon. So our question for you today to just have five minutes to be kind of chatting about is, can you share a time when something maybe didn't go as planned, didn't quite go as you might have expected, but it ended up being a bit of a blessing in disguise? So have a little chat around your tables, a time when something maybe didn't go quite as you'd have hoped or expected, but it was a blessing in disguise. Five minutes and we'll come back together.
Uh, like 30 more seconds, just if you want to round off a story, 30 more seconds. Okay, okay, let's, uh, let's just round that off there. I heard some good chatter. Um, I'm not always the first to do this, but I think today I'll see, is there any particularly good stories out there? You maybe want to nominate someone at your table who had a really good story to, sh to share. Um, any particular ones that would be worth kind of sharing out of kind of blessings in disguise from things maybe not going as expected. I hear back and forth here. Uh, okay, I'm going to go to Helen. <laughs> Fiona told a really good story <laughs> um, about losing out in a flat two days before the completion date, um, and then she had to stay with friends for 10 months, and then got an even better flat than she'd imagined at the beginning. There we go. A, a very much a story of blessing uh, there for Fiona. A any, other, any other stories to share? Any other moments of blessing? You want to maybe nominate anyone at your table that was like a really good story to share? Okay, I'll, I'll say that we kept it there, but I'm hopefully there was some, some good tales, some good moments of, of blessing in there. Today we're, um, we're in John's Gospel, so if you want to follow along, we're actually starting at the very end of John chapter 19, and we're in verse 41, but then we're kind of reading into uh, chapter 20. So it says this, this is after the crucifixion, after kind of the burial of Jesus. It says, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. On the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, i.e. John, and said, uh, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking she was talking to the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, please tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. Mary. She turned towards him, cried out in Aramaic, Rabbanai, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them the things he had said to her to say. Amen, and thanks to God for his words. I wonder if you've ever been in the kind of scenario, uh, driving along in the car with the sat-nav on, and it tries to make you make a turn that just makes no logical sense. 
Like it thinks that this road is the right road to take, but it's like someone's driveway or it's just a road that doesn't exist. And then you keep on going because you don't take the turn that it told you to take and it gets really annoyed at you for uh, not taking the turn and it keeps on trying to redirect you back. You get that voice that's like uh, um, something along the lines of, in a hundred yards, uh, please turn around. Or maybe at the roundabout, please take the fourth exit and go back the way you came just journeying backwards because it kind of gets stuck in this loop of this is the route it wants you to take and before it can recalibrate it tries its best to kind of force you back into the way that it thinks things should go. That happens quite a lot to Amy and I when we're going down to visit my nan who stays in the Soloway coast kind of down in Dumfrieshire. The sat-nav really wants us to take these little winding kind of single track country roads where you kind of get stuck behind a tractor for most of the journey and it really tries its best to kind of direct us onto those roads which I'm sure if you were traveling national speed limit would get you there faster but there's no way in this world that it's the best option when you can just take the mostly main roads until you eventually get to a single track road that you need to take to get to her house. But I think sometimes we can get a little bit like that too in life. We can get a little bit stuck. We think we know how things are going to go. We think we know how things are going to work out. We've got this plan, this intention. And then when they don't go that way, we don't know what to do. We get a little bit frozen, a little bit stuck, unclear on how we move forward from the place we have reached. Maybe we play a bit of that kind of what if game where you run through the different scenarios. What if I'd done this differently? What if that person had done that differently? Maybe that way things would have worked out the way I'd hoped. Running through, but not really moving forward. Hitting a little bit of a dead end. I wonder what was going through Mary Magdalene's head as she journeyed towards the tomb that morning. It's still dark out. Imagine that, pitch black, maybe with a torch in hand. There's no street lights or anything as she makes her way through wherever she was in the city out to this garden. That grief that she's feeling in that time, that uncertainty, this was Jesus, the man who had saved her, who had given her hope and purpose, who she had put her trust in, who she just adored, worshipped, and he was gone. What did that mean for her, for her future, for her purpose? What did it mean for the miracles she'd seen? What did it mean for so much of the life she had lived to this point? That uncertainty as she traveled through the streets, through the garden, to the tomb. And then she finally reaches this tomb and an even bigger mystery unfolds. The stone, this impossibly heavy stone has been moved out of the way and the tomb is empty. Where's his body? Who took it? What could have happened? Has someone stolen it? Why would they do that? Where is Jesus? Confusion, uncertainty mixed with grief and sorrow. You can feel the emotions that Mary is going through in these moments. Racing to the disciples, trying to get help, that sense of panic. Things were bad. Have they just gotten worse? Until eventually she finds herself sitting outside of the tomb, in this garden, weeping. I want to jump back before we delve too deep into this garden to think of a different garden that we find at the very beginning of the Bible. I've got another reading here from Genesis, from Genesis chapter 3. It's the end of Genesis chapter 3 and starting in verse 17. It should be on the screen for us as well. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree, which I'm about to command you, you must not eat from. Cursed is the ground because of you. Though painful, through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, from dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Then the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand And also take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. 
So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden a cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Today we're going to be reflecting on two gardens, two graves. This first garden, the very beginning garden, the beginning of our Bible story, the beginning of the interaction between God and man, this first garden that ultimately led to the grave. Through disobedience and selfishness, Adam and Eve got banished from that place of harmony with God. Banished and barred entry, a a guardian, a divine guardian sitting at the gate that none may enter, that none may come close to the tree of life. That their folly, that of Adam and Eve, is the same folly that we all make in our lives where we turn our back on God, where we conclude that we know what's best, our way, not his way, our desires, not his desires getting stuck in our sin, separating ourselves from God. Not that he really goes anywhere, but rather that we turn away from him. The curse of sin, the consequence of sin. A situation in which we can find ourselves that looks utterly hopeless. That first garden, it ultimately led to death traveling out to a time of toil, of struggle, until becoming dust, returning to dust. No way back by their making, no way back by our making into the harmony of God. A dire and desperate situation, one that looked an awful lot like a dead end. Yes, throughout the Old Testament, we get these moments, these cover-ups, we get the the law and and ways to at least come somewhat closer to God, but there is still this brokenness at the heart of humanity, this brokenness in relation to God, which seemingly had no fix. One dead end. And just like Mary Magdalene weaved her way through that dark city towards the tomb through the garden, not knowing what would come next, so Adam and Eve took their first steps out of that perfect garden, toil and uncertainty ahead, not knowing what would come next. The unknown can be a very isolating place. In those first steps, Adam and Eve walked out of all they'd ever known, paradise, the Garden of Eden, into this world of toil and struggle and strife. And while it was not of her making, we can see the same isolation in Mary. I find it really interesting. I hadn't seen this quite so much before, but the interaction between the disciples and Mary in this passage She goes to them as soon as she sees that the tomb is empty. And they run. uh, Peter and John run to the tomb. I absolutely love that little detail that John keeps on insisting on that he was fastest. I like to think that over the years as John kind of recoiled this story, retold this story, they would always just note that little note, I got there first. I was there first. Whatever Peter says, I made it there first. I was faster. Something very human to that, that little in-joke that you can imagine Peter getting kind of slightly annoyed by every time it was told. But yet, they get there, they see this empty tomb. Interestingly, although John gets there first, it's Peter that goes in, which I think shows something of both their character. They see this empty tomb, and then in verse 10 it says, the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. There's no indication here that Peter or John make any effort to support, encourage, console Mary in this moment. Maybe they were just too caught up 
in the, their own confusion, their own maybe excitement, their own uncertainty of what was going on. They just didn't even see her. They had to get on to the next thing. I don't know what was going through their mind, but what we're left with is Mary outside the tomb, weeping and seemingly alone. And then it says, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she, taught, she saw two angels standing in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. I don't know where they've put him. While the first garden was guarded by uh, a divine guard to stop anyone reaching the tree of life, here in this garden, these divine guardians are ones pointing the way to the Son who is the tree of life. One space mirroring the other. Admittedly, they do ask what feels like a slightly ridiculous question. She's there grieving at an empty tomb, and they ask her, what are you doing here? I feel like the answer seems at least a little bit obvious, but yet it seems important that it's asked. But Mary's response is what catches me more than anything else. She says the same thing twice in this passage where she points out the empty tomb, but just notice the difference. So the first time when she goes to the disciples, she said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Then to the angels, Mary says, they have taken my Lord away. I don't know where they've put him. In the first, the Lord, we don't know where he is. In the second, my Lord. I don't know where he is. The first, she's reporting an incident. The second, she's sharing from her personal experience. She's personalizing this moment. It's a subtle distinction, but I think that's one that's incredibly important. There are folks out there who will go to church every week, every day of their lives, who know the story who know who the Lord is, but have never taken that step to make it our story, our Lord, my Lord. Faith is personal because Jesus is personal. It's more than just sharing what is known. It is sharing what is felt, what is known on the inside, that personal connection with my Lord my Savior. We celebrate that he is risen in part because we know him. It's part of the beauty of the Easter, the resurrection narrative for all of its um, grand sort of far-reaching impact on humanity. It also has a deeply personal and individual call to it. Both are married together. Going on, the passage says, at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, Jesus calls her name. The disciples, they'd been so preoccupied, so focused on other things, that they had left her there in her grief, in her place of sorrow. But Jesus was there the whole time. Then Jesus says her name, Mary, and suddenly she sees something so simple can you imagine how many times over the year she was over the years she was traveling with Jesus that she'd heard Jesus say her name? Just one second. Is this mic okay? It's kind of crackling a lot for me. Is it the battery going? Uh, I can switch it off. Ah, yeah. Sorry. I 
little bit farther forward. There we go. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. The disciples, they had gotten preoccupied, carried away. They left her in her grief. But yet Jesus was there with her that whole time, calling her name. And as I was saying, I can only imagine how many times over the, the time that she'd spent with Jesus, she'd heard Jesus say her name. It was something you probably don't even think about. The people you care about, they, they say your name all the time. But then to never think you'll hear it again, and suddenly once more, that name cuts through. Cuts through the grief, cuts through the sorrow, to this point of relief, this point of joy, this point of disbelief for Mary. Can she even believe? that he is here, that he is risen. I don't know where you're at today, what you bring with you into this space, but I do know that just like Jesus, or just like Mary, Jesus sees you. He knows you. He knows all that you're going through. And he is with you even when you don't recognize him there. He calls your name. I imagine that Mary could have spent forever in that moment, arms around Jesus or worshiping at his feet, just in pure delight that he is risen, that he is there, maybe not understanding it, not understanding the mechanics or exactly what is going on, but just pure delight at that moment. However, from that place of comfort, of relief, Jesus then sends her on to the next. He has a purpose and a mission for her to go and to tell the disciples this good news. The phrase apostle is one that gets kind of thrown around a lot in church. Very simply, it means one who is sent. Well, in this moment, Mary is sent to the disciples. In a sense, she is an apostle to the apostles at the beginning to share this incredible news that he is risen. From this place of isolation and despair to relief and joy as he calls her name, calling and purpose leading her onwards. That is the beauty of the transformation of God in our lives. He meets us where we are at, he speaks to us, and he invites us onward to what he is doing to share in his purposes, to declare the good news of who he is. Which is where we step back from the personal to the bigger picture of all this. From this first garden at the beginning, which led to the grave in Adam and Eve and the brokenness of humanity, to now this grave, which leads out to the garden. Hope and resurrection in Christ. As Paul states in 1 Corinthians 15, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. What was broken in Adam, broken in humanity, was made right in Christ. And we can celebrate today, this day that he is risen, because we have hope eternal that is secured in Christ. From sorrow and suffering of the cross to the hope and joy of resurrection. Christ made a way for us to be free from our sin and to step forward with him into the eternal work of God. Where in Adam and our sin came death, in Christ comes life everlasting, hope to hold to no matter how difficult the road may get. Because he is risen, we have assurance that we will rise in him. That's the gospel worth sharing, the good news worth celebrating, especially on a day like today. The foundation of our call and our purpose as Christians is to declare he is risen. He is alive. 
It's the beauty of God that he's there in that personal call, calling Mary by her name from her place of despair. And he's there in the universal, making a way for all who accept that incredible grace that is offered thanks to the death and resurrection of Jesus. The question for us is how do we respond to him calling our name? To the invitation that God has placed before you? What do you say? How do you respond? This room is filled, I'm sure, with a thousand different stories, different experiences, different journeys here and there that leads us to this place. But ultimately, when it boils down, there's only really two stories to be told. Those who walk from the garden to the grave and those who walk from the grave to the garden. The invitation is before us. The personal call of Christ is there. The choice and the steps are ours to embrace. So this Easter Sunday, ask yourself, do you just know the story or is it your story? And join us as we together celebrate that he is alive, that he has made a way to undo the corruption and the sin that came from Adam and the beginning, that he has called your name and that he has invited you to go and tell others of his grace. Amen. Let us pray together. I'm just going to invite out the band as I pray. Almighty God, we thank you that in all your cosmic, eternal plans, your hopes, your workings, that you see each of us individually, that you call us by name, that you see us exactly as we are in the place that we find ourselves. Be it weeping outside the tomb, be it in uncertainty, be it even in places of goodness and joy, you see us, you know us, and you call us by name. Let us turn back to you. Let us recognize you in that moment, what we maybe didn't see before. Let us hear your call on each of us, that we too, like Mary, may go out and share the good news that you are alive, that you have made a way where there was no way possible, that you have done what seemed impossible, that you have provided a hope and a future beyond that which we can comprehend, that we may step, that we may trust, that we may walk in you, God of grace, God of mercy, God of love. We thank you that you are going, willing to go to lengths beyond that which we could imagine or comprehend. For us, for love for us, and love for your children in this world. So let us partner with you in this endeavor, which stretches beyond the personal into the global, stretches beyond ourselves to the world outside on the streets of Glasgow and beyond, that we may be your people pronouncing that you have risen. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing Thine Be the Glory.
church with gladness hymns of triumph sing for her lord now liveth death has lost its sting thine be the glory risen conquering sun endless is the victory the Lord death has won no Thank you. 